<clears throat> so Japan, Japan again, you know, it's it's like it is unavoidable. If you talk about architecture of a certain quality, Japan Japan has to uh, uh, pop up or, or show up. Is is they they are they are there, and I and I wonder <clears throat> why are they there? You know why this island, which is not the most uh, easy place to live in, <clears throat> is so relevant to architecture. They have, I think, if I'm not wrong, but. I think they have the, the 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 biggest number of Pritzker laureates, uh, Japan, and they keep moving the world of architecture. Why? Because they are experimental. Because they work very hard. Uh, there is a dedication in Japan and a great, great, great concern with uh, with uh, with uh, being in the present, so to speak. But being in the present doesn't preclude them from uh, thinking about the future. Also, it doesn't preclude them from uh, being anchored in a very rich and meaningful past, the past of their own culture. So Kiyonori Kikutake uh, was one of the most gifted and influential of the metabolist generation that dominated post-war Japan. His architecture remains as powerful as ever. And uh, this I took from, uh, I forgot exactly where, a lecture about him or by him, I think about him. And I think this is very, very important today as well. So learning from Kionori Kikutake, one, agri agricultural landscape, primitiveness and symbolism. Uh, truly, if we think about these three commandments almost, I think they would apply to our time as well. Let's start with the first one, agricultural landscape. I wrote to Kenneth Frampton um, about um, a year ago. I was showing him a, a text I wrote about a competition about Baghdad, uh, no, Babylon, Redux. And he replied to me, he said, I don't know anything about Babylon. Uh, this was about a competition to, to promote some kind of a new architecture inspired by the, uh, the architectural visionary works of uh, a Dutch artist, and it was his centennial, I'm talking about Constant, who, who had a big, big, big project called the New Babylon. So anyway, I sent this to, to Kenneth and, and, and he replied and he said, I don't know anything about the, the Babylon, but I know that the future will be about uh, urban agriculture and, uh, and uh, harvesting uh, rainwater. Now, let's think about this. You know, a very knowledgeable uh, man like uh, Kenneth Frampton thought that the future will be about urban agriculture and harvesting rainwater. Uh, and then Yes, we know about the climate changes. Uh, we know about um, you know pollution. We know about uh, some things that are challenging us, and it's very possible that um, the intuitions of Kikutake are um, uh, worthy of of being um, considered. Primitiveness, primitiveness what we call primitiveness could be a return to the roots uh, to, 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 to question, you know, the excesses of uh, what is called progress and the excesses of, excesses of consumerism, uh, the excesses of uh, capitalism, the excesses of uh, hedonism. Uh, primitiveness brings, brings us back to that beginning that Louis Kahn said is in harmony with the human nature. So uh, while I have one of my preferred books is actually on primitive architecture. That's how it is called, primitive architecture. Well, what is primitive architecture? Is the architecture in a way before architecture? Is the architecture before the architect? Is the architecture of, uh, you know, vernacular, uh, a vernacular little village in uh, in Africa, or uh, I don't know, any kind of settlement, human settlement, and there is an incredible richness there, and power, and uh, uh, 
coordination which was done instinctually between function and form. And really, uh, it's a beautiful book. And I, who is interested, I could give you the title and you can, you can purchase it, you can find it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the, the 18 volumes of the world uh, uh, history of architecture uh, edited by Pierluigi Nervi. And symbolism. I think we need symbolism. And Kenzo Tange, another very important Japanese architect who was also involved with the metabolist movement, also understood that architecture has a, a symbolic uh, you know, uh, quality that shouldn't be forgotten. We don't work too much uh, in the field of symbolism, but I think it is needed, uh, very much so. Because if for no other reason, but because we have a spiritual life as well, no? And even Ginny Gang said, you know, a life which, which doesn't have an intellectual uh, construct is boring. So a building is not just a building. It has to have, a, in a way, a second discourse. And that second discourse is about, uh, you know, you could say symbolism, uh, spirituality, um, metaphor. There are various attributes which are of an intangible nature. They are metaphysical. And the Japanese are very good at this. So the metabolist Kionori Kikutake's Marine City from 1968. Uh, it was then at the end of the 60s, uh, uh, a, a world which, which wanted change. There were the protests of the students in Sorbonne or the United States or uh, Great Britain and other parts of the world, young people rebelled against um, the obsession with money, against banks, uh, against the war. This was very important. And so in this climate, uh, some Japanese architects grouped themselves together and created the metabolist movement. And Kikutake was an important part of this movement. Uh, what do we see here? We see a marine city, a city that was to expand on water. Uh, yes, it is a progressivist city. It is a city that is not, uh, you know, uh, placidly um, uh, rejecting, uh, you know, the, the, the ability of human beings to, to move beyond, uh, you know, uh, difficulties. But they needed, Japan needed, already it was an economical force in, at the end of the 60s. And, and it was a heroic Japan. And these architects were also uh, inclined heroically towards uh, um, stirring up the energies of their people and uh, their culture towards progress, towards the future. And that's what we see here is, uh, an expression that some might think is utopian, but uh, you know, it's not truly really a, a utopia that is unrealizable. I think it's un real, realizable, and uh, I think it's 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 uh, uh, to be applauded that that ar the architect refuses to only dwell in the possible and in the known. They also need to uh, envision new hor new horizons of hope. And um, yes, there was technology. Uh, he relied and they relied a lot of, on technology because Japan understood what China understood, that they cannot, that it would be impossible to, to remove themselves from the ashes of the Second World War without technology. And they did it brilliantly. Here he is with, uh, you know, his... Uh, you know the the pragmatism. I say he might say the his useless uh, towers, but uh, without these so-called useless things, what would humanity be? In fact, we are moved forward exactly by such attempts at so-called uh, uselessness. The sky house. This was his own house from 1958. Um, now maybe it doesn't impress us a lot. 
now although you know it's 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 not banal and it's it's uh, it does have a, le a level of uh, of uh, you know even flamboyance you know uh, geometrical flamboyance if i can call it so it's it's it it is here on earth but it also has a, a something it is something about it which might qualify it for uh, a certain um, otherworldly, um, you know, attributes. He built it for himself. What I understood is in Japan, strangely, although it's a, a society that is very structured hierarchically, um, experiments are very possible in Japan because the, the codes of construction are, are rather uh, not very strict. So they, they, they can do lots of things, which in other parts of the world would be more difficult to, to arrive at or do. You'll see later on, uh, Rem Kolhas interviewed uh, Kikutake inside his um, uh, sky house or, you know, his, his own uh, home. Uh, I, I, I continue to think that architecture is, uh, is, is uh, at its best when, when it is fresh, when it, is, uh, when it represents, uh, you know, a new attitude uh, and, 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 and it exemplifies a certain form of courage. Uh, I know it's not easy to do it, to implement it, but what is the alternative? Uh, to 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 live in and work in a mild way and in a you know uh, lukewarm water way. Uh, things are complicated now because you know here we see a lot of concrete. We know that concrete uh, generates pollution. Um, the heroism of those years, perhaps we we could turn them upside down somehow. We could turn it upside down in the sense that. Maybe we need some kind of an, uh, an heroism in reverse. I don't know. I don't know exactly how, but this is to be investigated. You know, the, the young architects of the world should think about ways of, uh, of continuing to serve, uh, you know, human life, but without neglecting what is not human and also without neglecting um, without neglecting uh, the climatic problems, pollution, the rising levels of the seas and uh, melting of the icebergs. Uh, we live, I think, in complicated, uh, complicated times. But again, I think the intelligence and the sensitivity and the energy of the human being should be able to, you know, uh, address at least some of these problems uh, creatively. His house was different from the houses around it. You see, some might say, wait a minute, you know, uh, why couldn't he be, uh, the, you know, the traditional like the others around? Well, you know, yes, maybe there is a, a certain level of um, dissonance, but uh, this was always the case. Even Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, he complained in, in, in about the Denmark of his time, that it was all leveled and it was not possible for a thinker who stand out, just like this house by Kikutake stands out. So certain people like to stand out, you know, because they have something to say, which cannot be properly expressed in this way. But this is a, an interesting picture because it shows in a way the relationship between the so-called exceptional man and, and the other man. Now, of course, you could have a very exceptional man here or woman, maybe even more exceptional than the architect. But the architect was able to visualize his so-called exceptionalism in this way. So th this house was... Um, you know, 50, 60 years uh, ago built. So it's, it's not the most recent house on earth. But in the, in the strictness of its geometry, and uh, it's different from, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, house elevated from the earth was also promoted by Le Corbusier and other people. But his house is um, distinct from uh, what, uh, let's say, Le Corbusier pro uh, proposed and even built. Uh, it, I would say, looking at it, that it is somehow Japanese. Now, of course, I know it is Japanese, and so maybe that's why I say it. But no, it's something about the, the you know, the primitiveness of its geometry, uh, its clarity. But 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 its clarity is not truly really, uh, about a Cartesian kind of uh, European uh, kind of uh, clarity. Still, uh, something archetypal here that that seems to connect, I think, with the with the cultural roots of uh, of Japan. Now, uh, changes occurred in time. This, this is a picture that is uh, closer to our time. And this is the, the open space at the top, uh, a large living room. But even this space, I think, has something, has something of Japan. Anyway, it was called the Sky House because you know it was uh, removed from from uh, uh, an explicit uh, connection with the Earth. I wonder what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright would have would have said about this house, because for Wright, as you know, the building was to grow from the Earth. This one, uh, it's almost like it's a house which 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 landed on Earth from the conceptual sky of the artist or the architect. It doesn't, it didn't really grow from the earth. It's very simple, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, it would qualify to be called um, you know, Japanese. It's almost a contradiction in terms, if you think about its name, the Sky House. I don't know who this person is, but we recognize the house, of course, it's Kikutake's house. And um, <clears throat> apparently the house was, uh, I didn't read the, this, uh, this, this text, but uh, it's possible that uh, it was not just a formal, uh, you know, play or game. You see here, uh, there are references to uh, other things, you know, and uh, in this sense, it's less simplistic that you might feel tempted to consider it at the first sight. Ram Kolhas interviewing Kikutake within his home, the Sky House. Here they are. And it moves me this, you know, this, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, one, one important architect uh, visits another important architect. And, uh, you know, is this curiosity, this desire to learn, to dialogue, to, in a way, to, to, to make the world move, to change the world. And, Truly, I, 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 I believe that, that, that this is what uh, art and architecture and uh, other fields of cultural uh, activity are about, uh, about bringing people together, you know, uh, and uh, we should do this with our own means as much as possible. And I think uh, it's very possible at all levels to, 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 to have such uh, uh, gatherings. Okay, now we, we go to something else. Uh, and in Japan, they still build temples. 
this is an ossuary. You know what that is? Is 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 a is a place where the the bones of the of the dead are uh, uh, are kept. Uh, but it's a temple, and uh, you know. In Europe, we don't build temples, but in Japan they do. They did and do and will do. And 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 this is part of the of the force of Japan that it didn't divorce itself from uh, deeply felt spiritual concerns. Uh, of course, looking at it, you say, "What temple is this? This is not a temple." It doesn't look like a temple. Uh, we don't see the Greek uh, Doric columns or uh, some other order. Quite the opposite. We see this strange, uh, brutal, brutalist, uh, concrete uh, cap, you know, uh, that doesn't seem to make sense. Well, <laughs> I think it does. If we if we look at it uh, as as as. Uh, as expressing the otherness of, of what death is, you know, and the otherness of what a temple is. A temple shouldn't be like we copy it from the history books, you know, from ancient Greece or whatever. And uh, I think there are interesting things here. I, I didn't analyze it carefully, but it is intriguing this, the height of the base, the bottom of this, uh, uh, superior part, you know, I would be curious to see a human being. He certainly wanted to say something here about this is maybe the duality of the, the dichotomy of life and death, empty and full. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have a feeling that there is a symbolism here that uh, needs to be discovered and, and, and thought about. Again, we are dealing with a, with an architect immersed in the mythology and uh, you know the yeah the, the the very deeply felt past that it has Japan and so I am very glad that they didn't just mimic the form of a temple. He created a new structure, but this structure is not divorced from uh, from. Uh, as I said, deeply felt spiritual uh, uh, concerns. I think Japan is, uh, and is not the only one, usually Asia and the East is, is, is capable to, of negotiating between technology, high technology, because let us not forget Kikutake also did those, and we are going to see other urban studies of a utopian nature, a very technologized. And so on one hand, a very spiritual person. On the other hand, a highly knowledgeable uh, pioneer of using technology in architecture. So you have both technology and spirit. And uh, I would say that China is, uh, is doing things kind of in a similar way now, and they are unstoppable. They even stopped the pandemic, maybe not perfectly, but it is amazing, in my opinion, what they did. And even more amazing is that we are not following them. It, it is actually incredible to me that the most developed, developed countries in the world are unable to understand or unwilling that somehow the Chinese did the right thing because they had a the, the very small number of deaths. Even if the, the, the declared numbers are not uh, always the most uh, accurate, but I still think um, it's difficult to lie about such matters today because there are satellites all over the, uh, the, the sky that, that could uh, check on, on all kinds of facts. So now I, they have stadiums that are full of people now. Obviously, the pandemic is not active. While in the other countries of the world, uh, the pandemic is still ravishing. So anyway, forget about China. Now we are in Japan, but I think we can learn. I think the West can learn a lot from the East as well. Of course, the East also learned from the West. And uh, both Japan and China, uh, where they had students of, of, of the achievements of the West, 
but now maybe it's also time for us in the West to learn from the East. Anyway, it's an interesting uh, building and uh, it deserves more uh, attention and more analysis. I am against analysis, but sometimes analysis is necessary. Uh, and um, it deserves, you know, some of these buildings truly deserve to be studied with a pencil in hand or, uh, I don't know, digitally to reflect, to look at the plans and the sections, to try to understand, even re redraw it. A hotel, a hotel which is a modern program, but the, the architectural expression here is modern, but it's also, you can tell, it's, it's kind of connected with, uh, with the Japanese past. And uh, I like it. I think, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting building. Maybe a little bit less now, even here. So again, we see a Japan that is not uh, the victim of, of, of um, having no interest in, uh, in, uh, in bringing something new. Quite the opposite. They bring the new in very, very well. It could have been anything. It's called a hotel, but uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe Bernard Tumi was right. For <coughs> fiction, this building could could function in various ways, not just as a hotel. In fact, it doesn't even look quite like a hotel. That type, he, you'll see another hotel by him which does look like a hotel more than this one. This one could have been anything, a cultural center, a, a city hall, anything. So Kionori Kikutake, um, an interesting metabolist Japanese uh, architect. And tomorrow I think will be, I think tomorrow, Tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, I will talk about uh, Kisho Kurokawa, himself a very accomplished and a very uh, uh, important metabolist architect. These Japanese are truly, uh, in my opinion, very, very inspiring. Now here we see Mount Fuji and uh, the hotel by, he didn't do this uh, artwork, but uh, you know, a relationship between the building by Kikutake and the famous sacred mountain of Japan. The Pacific Hotel, another hotel, actually he, I think he built two more. A modernistic hotel, a hotel is not a, a program with spiritual attributes, but uh, it is a, you know, the same architect who built a temple ossuary uh, built uh, a few hotels and also did uh, urban studies and marina city and so on. This is the plan of this hotel. Now this one, da uh, yes, looks more like a hotel. Interesting that he, I'm um, particularly talking now to the students, uh, the university here, because in the school here it is totally interdicted to bring the bathroom towards the outside. Not only that he brought them outside, I mean, they are on the facade, but they are distinctly uh, expressed outside. And, and actually, you know, they have uh, so-called three sides uh, towards the outside. If you make abstraction of the, of the curved uh, form here. So there. You know, the dogma, not to use a, not to place a bathroom outside. Well, Kikutake did it. And what is wrong with it? And he was not the only one. Look, this is the bathroom. Right there for all to see. It's fine. I mean, uh, our dogmas are so uh, almost sinister, you know. <laughs> if you would make something like this in the school here, they, you'll be totally uh, demolished, you know. You'll... Uh, and we are dealing here with a very important um, uh, architect. And look what he did. And it's very, it's, it's actually very functional, no? Uh, it works. And these, these capsules actually contribute to the, the ex expressivity, the expression of the building. We see them here. There are these here. 
and this this uh, this uh, this um, uh, the Japanese are very without inhibitions in this field. Really, they they I don't know how how uh, it's strange because uh, socially uh, they are very with a very rigid hierarchy. But in terms of uh, of uh, architecture, they 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 do anything. They can do anything, and so are the Japanese, the the Chinese these days. This was the future. <laughs> I found this uh, expression uh, relating to to his work because of uh, you will see several uh, works by him. This was the future. I, I like this expression. You know that this was the future. Uh, this reminds me of an expression of Su Fujimoto, uh, primitive futures. It's about the same thing, the primitive futures. You see, the Japanese are complex. They, they, they see the relationship on the spiral of time between what is called the past and what is called the future. Uh, this is a civic center from 1966. Look at this. Now, who would make such a city hall? Or a city center. Look at this. I like it very much. It's it's brutalist. It's technological. It's uh, it's um, it's some kind of uh, uh, you know almost diabolical techno uh, insect. And you know it's about expressivity. Expressivity is about, but also about function. I am sure that what we see here was not done. Uh, you know. Uh, frivolously without any it, it's it's not about aesthetics but the but the result is is strikingly uh, original this is what you get when you are allowed when, when when you allow architects to 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 think with their own minds and 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 and, and with the energy that a uh, genuinely felt uh, inspiration is allowed to express itself this is the, the same thing, but I like the fact that is also the wording in Japanese. Japanese. Um, okay. A very interesting building, I would say. You know, it's, this was built uh, 60 years ago. It's still a striking building. So very different from what we saw previously by him, 1966, 19, uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, I don't know, no, July 1966. Kikutake, Kionori Kikutake. Do not forget this building because I think it deserves not to be forgotten. We'll see other things by him that, uh, <clears throat> that deserve not to be forgotten. Now look at the, I don't know exactly, I mean, you know, it, it appears to be uh, capriciously using geometry in a certain way, but, but here we see something else, the presence of the spiral in the section of the building. And so, uh, you know, the, there was study here, there was uh, complexity that uh, it's, it's worthy of being uh, appreciated and understood. Nice work, Kikutake. Bravo. Now, the Expo Tower in Osaka from 1972, that famous international exhibition where Japan showed already its proudness in the field of uh, futurology and technology and exploration, and the architects were invited to, to, to express themselves accordingly. And we see now a tower that he built at that uh, expo. It's here, clearly a building that, uh, that believes in the connection between biology and architecture, between geometry and technology. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a Japan that, that, uh, that uh, through very, very, very hard work uh, was able to arrive at the top uh, among the nations and uh, the, the, the exhibition uh, uh, illustrated this very well. There were some, this was done by uh, Kisho Kurokawa, of whom I, I will talk probably tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. 
uh, and uh, they had brilliant architects here who, and it's a very playful and uh, optimistic, uh, it was a famous, uh, most international exhibitions are interesting, but this one, uh, uh, maybe even more than, 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 than most of them. So this tower was built by Kionori, Kionori Kikutake. So, you know, technology is not necessarily opposed to what we call uh, organicism or now. You, you can use uh, technology to, to, uh, to serve the organic qualities of life. And this is what I seem to see here, actually. Now, this is a project by a student in London. Somehow I felt like incorporating this, um, this work by this uh, uh, student in, in this presentation. Synthetic ecology. It has to do with synthesis, with, ecolo with, with technology and with ecology. And I think this is very important for us today. The Royal College of Art graduate Chang Yob Lee has developed a concept to transform the BT Tower in London into a pollution harvesting high rise. Very interesting, you know. I mentioned a few times, not just today, but also in the past days, pollution, that there is a lot of pollution in the world and there is a lot of pollution in Bucharest. What do we do? What do we do with this? And this, this uh, architect, this student in architecture had the idea to harvest pollution. And so he did this uh, strange uh, project, which would no doubt fail in a school like ours, would not even be taken into consideration. Uh, and uh, let me read a few things about this. Entitled Syntec Ecology, the project predicts the eventual redundancy of the 189-meter tower that tower in London existing, currently used for telecommunications, and suggests repurposing, repurposing it as an eco skyscraper that collects airborne dirt particles and helps to reduce the level of respiratory illness in London. Um, now you might say here that, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't really it's not very clear what's going on here because of uh, the architectonic, if I can call it so, expression. The process would involve extracting the carbon from petrol fumes and using it to produce sustainable biofuel. I think there is a great field here where the intelligence and the intuitions of the students of architecture and young architects and not just young architects to explore ways, yes, to reverse the, the, the malevolent forces of the world, and pollution is one of them. Uh, I don't know exactly how he, uh, you know, technically speaking, how he wanted to do this. The project is about a new infrastructure gathering resources from pollutants in the city atmosphere, which could be another valuable commodity in the age of depleting resources. Indeed, we are living in the age of depleting resources. So what he was trying to do, if I understood well, was to use a negative resource, if I can call it so, pollution, and transform it into something positive. Now, the, you know, the specifics of his aesthetical decisions, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, they, they are subjective and uh, I am subjective in, uh, in uh, perceiving them, evaluating them. But uh, all in all, what's important, just like in the case of Kionori Kikutake, is to think more than, I mean, beyond, you know, just building a little building. That's architecture is supposed to, to, to serve life in, in many ways, not just, of course, building a building is still part of what architecture is. But as Kikutake showed, as the student shows, it should have interests which go beyond the mere design of a, of a, of a, of a single building. Now you could say this is madness. 
Well, yes, but it is also the madness of our time. It is our mad madness. Is this net net network of, of relationships and these spiraling, uh, you know, uh, uh, parts of this building which are supposed to? I didn't read that text. I should have read it, perhaps, but not at this resolution. The idea is to 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 capture the pollution and transform it in something else. Referencing a quote from architect Buckminster Fuller, Lee says, pollution is nothing but the resources we are not harvesting. We, are, we allow them to disperse because we've been ignorant of their value. He adds, pollution could be another economy. Interesting thought. But what I show here is another kind of architectural diploma something again in our case is inconceivable because we are not we are not accustomed to think in terms of changing the world while a school like this one in london and the student like this one in london they were concerned and are concerned with changing the world synthet syntec ecology is Lee's diploma project from the architecture program at the royal college of art in london and he was one of the two winners of the Shepard Robson Student Prize for Architecture at the Royal Academy of Art Summer Exhibition. Nice. Okay, so, um, yes, it's nice even graphically, I would say. It's engaging, it's intriguing, it's provoking, as a, as a, as a creative work should be. I show it just to show that that, that Kikutake has followers, so to speak. So between 1968 and 1983, Kikutake produced numerous projects for floating cities with evocative names such as Marine City, 1958, 1963, and 1971, and Ocean City, 1959 and 1969. In 1975, he finally got to build a real one, Aguapolis. Aguapolis was a 10,000 square meter floating city, a crossover between an aircraft carrier and an oil rig. It, it, it formed the centerpiece of the Okinawa uh, Ocean Expo. So now we'll see pictures of the Aguapolis. Of course, Agua means water uh, from 1975. He built it. So again, the dream can be built. Utopia can be built. We just have to believe in it. And uh, often what we call utopia is, is just uh, something that will come sooner or later. And, uh, you know, better sooner than later. He built it. Kikutake built it on water. And I'm going to show a little later, uh, in fact, after this, another um, uh, interesting uh, project on water, this time by uh, an American uh, team, uh, Elizabeth Diller and Ricardo Scofidio. Um, okay, Kikutake, we saw this already. There are still many possibilities in this world, I think, you know, and uh, I think it's important to dream and it's important to act or to use the words of uh, Ginny Gang to, to, to work within what is she called the actionable idealism, meaning an idealism which, which can be, uh, you know, uh, given, given sub substance through implementation. Now, I don't know exactly what is written here. Uh, maybe you can read. I mean, you can read. I didn't. Uh, so he aimed to create urban spaces on the, on the high seas. So Agua Police was home to the largest single room ever put to sea, but it was also a, a slick presentation of what the future might hold 
filled with exhibits detailing Agopolis' self-sufficiency and livability. Okay, Diller and Scofidio, the Blur Building, maybe you know this. They did a provocative uh, piece for, a, again, for an exhibition in Switzerland on a lake. You'd think somehow that it has something similar to, to Tikutake, but there are also uh, uh, overtones here. There are also other things. Here. So the structure, yes, was built on water uh, in Switzerland, on a lake, but uh, you see technology, uh, technology through and through. But what this building did generated this fog. It's a blurred building. It's, uh, this is kind of typical of this, this uh, team, uh, Diller and Scofidio, that they, uh, uh, there is a self-derogatory gesture here. The building that uh, instead of asserting itself is actually hiding away through, look, this is the building. Now, those who uh, design the facades of buildings would be uh, puzzled, no? Uh, where is the facade of the building? You know, <laughs> it's gone. It's the, the fog. It's the fog that the, the, the machine, the, the structure generated. Um, I don't know exactly the technicalities, but the idea is that they built a structure on water which generates its uh, self-negation in a way. The building disappears behind a fog or uh, this kind of cloud. That's why it's called a blurred building. Usually a building is the very opposite of being blurred, but this one is blurred. You move towards a cloud, towards a fog. You, you move towards something you don't see. In reality, it is like this, but because it generates this uh, fog, uh, the, this cloud, um, you know, it's almost like a liquid uh, fire, if I can call it so. Interesting work by Diller and Scofidio. Not as profound, perhaps, and not so interested. In fact, from what I remember, they used, you know, almost an esoteric kind of uh, uh, functioning for this building. It, it, it was not concerned like the building by Kikutake with, uh, you know, the future of the world and the sustainability. No, this was about something else. But in terms of, uh, you know, uh, if I can call it architectural ex expression, if we can remove the blurring, they seem to have something in common. The Izumo Shrine, this is a nice building uh, by, by Kikutake. Again, the same man who uh, was interested in technology and uh, you know, urban uh, life on sea, on high seas, and it also built the ossuary and, and built now a shrine, a shrine which is, uh, which is uh, both modern and ancient. I would say, if I look at it as a building. It's a fine building. It's a fine building which doesn't say no to the spiritual side of life, as it shouldn't. Uh, here we see on the right the old shrine, and here we see the new one by Kikutake. And this one didn't try to mimic what was here. No, it's a new structure, it's, it's resolutely belonging to the present, his present, but, but I don't think it's totally, uh, you know, irreverentious towards what preceded it. And I like the, 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 the dialectics between the old and the new. But this creates, uh, you know, the genuineness of being alive in the moment. Of, of, of advancing in a way, not being uh, stagnated. At terrace houses, he built also uh, uh, collective houses, quite interesting, 1975. Um, you know, uh, so-called brutalist architecture, but very, I mean, a virile architecture and uh, structurally, uh, you know, sound. 
Uh, I only have two pictures with this one here, but I have more here with the Pasadena Heights is the name of a housing complex in Mishima uh, and designed by Kionori Kikutake. This is modernism through and through, but because of the sincerity of the work and the vigor, I would say that, um, you know, it doesn't really contradict what we call the past. I don't think it does. And it probably sits well on the, on the hilly side of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the site plan. Although he said that he didn't want his buildings to be mountain-like, uh, as, as some architects today try to do, like um, Ingels, uh, for example, you know, uh, we, 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 we level the, 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 the mountains and now we try to be buildings, to build buildings which look like, like mountains. But if we look at these buildings here and we look at this building here, we see a new dimension, the urban dimension, the collectiveness uh, and uh, I don't know, there is something refreshing, I think, about this housing complex by Kionori Kikutake. Yes, unfortunately, it used concrete. What can we do? At that time, concrete was not seen as being uh, as malevolent as we see it now because of pollution. Urban studies, he did also urban studies, uh, you know, you could say, who asked him to do this? <laughs> His conscience. He was an architect. Uh, if the architect doesn't do this, who should do this? Uh, you know, this is beautiful about the, this generation of Japanese architects that they, they built, as you saw clearly, Kikutake built, but also uh, they, they understood that the architect is an agent of transformation for society and life in general. An architect is not only someone who serves a so-called beneficiary, is also someone who makes proposals for a better life in his vision or her vision. Uh, and uh, this, this, again, actionable idealism is very, very important. Sofitel Tokyo by Kionori Kikutake, 1994. Unfortunately, I understood this building was destroyed, was demolished. What a shame. Uh, this one probably was not destroyed, but this one, much more audacious and interesting, uh, was destroyed. How very sad. So the Japanese made mistakes too. What can we do? Um, it was a fine tower, you know. Maybe the buildings uh, in the proximity felt jealous of it and, uh, you know, they, they asked for its removal and it was removed. But it's very sad. On the other hand, the building through these photographs reveals an architect who was audacious, as I said. And we need audacious architects. Another tower from 1976. Uh, this one, I don't know what function it has. Uh, it seems like it's more like a sculpture. So he worked in various ways. Uh, and uh, it shows uh, an architect uh, equally at home with uh, horizontality and verticality. Uh, an interesting and complex architect. A hotel, another hotel in Ginza. This one does look like a hotel more than uh, than the previous ones. Is this one here? Now the Edo Tokyo Museum. Uh, <clears throat> Edo uh, is actually. Um, you know, uh, a name given to, uh, to Tokyo. Uh, this is a building that is um, 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 not 
futuristic, but um, confident that the future will be dynamic, uh, technological. Uh, there is an optimism about the structure, which maybe we do not have these days. But at that time and in that place in Japan, it existed. It's quite a big building. This one, in a way, is also a sky building because it's kind of similar to the house he built for himself. And it's quite big, you see it here. Okay, a marine city in Hawaii, a proposal from 1971 because he was uh, almost obsessed by moving on water. Uh, and uh, he made several proposals and you saw he built a building like this. So extending the city of man, of the human beings uh, beyond, the, beyond the earth on water. And this is the Ecopolis from early 1990s, another utopian uh, proposal. The architect as urbanist, we are talking about this, the architect as an urbanist. Here we see, you know, a correspondence, I mean, a similarity to the tower that he built and unfortunately was demolished. And the Catholic Church, unfortunately, I only found this picture and I, I, I don't know, was it built, was it not? Uh, but an interesting, uh, an interesting, engaging uh, image. I only found this image. I, do, I don't even know if it is by him. I mean, it appeared to be by him, but I couldn't find other pictures. Okay, and now we go to Mario Botta, a very different architect. So let's wish Kikutake a happy birthday. It is his birthday today. And now we go to a very different architect, but living uh, approximately, well, for some period of time, uh, they were contemporaries. Mario Botta, he's still alive. This is the man, a friend of the university here and uh, Dr. Honoris Causa here in Bucharest. Uh, and the founder of uh, the Mendrisio School of Architecture in Switzerland. Here he is uh, giving a talk. And uh, here he is with, uh, with someone else whose name I do not know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they are in Japan. This is, almost looks like the Fuji, Fuji mountain, uh, the sacred mountain of, of, of Japan. I don't know. And I don't know, I'm very curious what they are looking for, turning their backs on the, on the, on the mountain. Anyway, he studied at the, in Venice, at the School of Architecture in Venice. And uh, of course, he was Italian, but uh, born in Switzerland. Uh, you know, the, Switzerland has, has and had uh, interesting uh, men, uh, people of, uh, in, uh, of Italian ancestry, born in Switzerland, like Giacometti as well. Anyway, some, some buildings from 1970. In my opinion, what he built at first, his first buildings are the most interesting. A single family house. Also, apparently, I read on Wikipedia that he built at 16, he built a house for his family. But he was not 17 here. He was, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway, from 1971, he was 30 something to 1973, he built this single family house in Riva San Vitale in Switzerland. And I think it was an excellent building, you know, uh, and uh, it shows the will of, of, uh, of, of the human. It has geometry, it has uh, the contrast with nature, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice parallelism between the work of man and the work of God or nature. And this is the section. So you enter in the building at the top of the building, as opposed to, as it often, it is often the case 
at the bottom. I saw recently the latest building by uh, Sir Richard Rogers, uh, the, his latest work before he died. And it was also, well, only this part, I would say, a very interesting uh, structure and building by Sir Richard Rogers without this. But uh, the, uh, somehow similar in the approach to uh, being in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a natural um, context with a sloping uh, land and uh, trees around and so on. I will talk about that building soon because I liked it very much. So this is the house, 1970 something by uh, Mario Botta. And I think uh, it, it was a remarkable building, a remarkable building. Uh, too bad that later on he, he started to repeat himself and arrived at some kind of mannerism. I don't show all his buildings here, but I show quite a number of them until very recently. So these are the plans of the house. and the section. So in essence, you enter at the top and then you descend to the other floors of the house. And here is, uh, he, ha he has this scheme where he shows the, the various floors of the house. I mean, all the floors of the house in kind of a progression. There is a certain determinism here, which in his later works becomes a little bit bothering. But um, anyway, a middle school. He, so he built uh, all kinds of things, banks, uh, office buildings, museums, schools, uh, houses, and a lot of churches, actually. He believed in the sacred space. He even wrote about sacred architecture and the sacred space. But this middle school is rather concerned with social, uh, the social aspects of, of uh, education and life. And I like it very much. I think it's, I mean, yes, it's, uh, it's brutalist. It's, uh, but I like the fact that it, that it is not adorned. There is, a, there is a freshness, I think, here that, we don't quite have it any longer somehow. In those years, the end of the 60s, just like we, we saw in the case of Kikutake and in the works of Mario Bota now, there was a, a concern for, for collectiveness and uh, there was a, uh, a belief somehow in, in rejuvenation, in renewing the world. Unfortunately, it didn't last for long for Mario Bota either. Anyway, this is a school, a school that he built in Switzerland. Interesting sculpture somehow on the grounds, uh, fragments of the human body. Um, this was the, you know, the perspectival drawing of the school. Some saw, and I'm sure he was aware of it, some connection somehow between his works and those of Louis Kahn. In my opinion, Louis Kahn was a, was a better architect, but um, Mario Botta, with his uh, best works, I think, uh, uh, established himself as a significant architect. Unfortunately, uh, with the arrival of postmodernism, and then after postmodernist deconstruction, Mario Botta became less uh, talked about. But it was a time in the 70s and 80s when, when he was uh, notorious. And, you know, there were many publications about his works. And some of them truly deserved uh, to be known and, and seen. As opposed to other architects, um, I mean, for example, Zaha Hadid built just one private house. Mario Botta built a lot. He also built a lot of churches. This is also something rather unique in our time. 
you see, the interior is very uh, frost, is, is, is um, you know, uh, it doesn't have adornments, it doesn't try to give uh, illusions and delusions through sweetness. It's an urban interior somehow, an urban interior, but appropriate, I would say, for the vitality of the building. At that time also, uh, Japan was, was working with uh, concrete in a very uh, convincing way. Uh, and this, this we see in, in, in Switzerland. Now, uh, Oscar Wilde, uh, with his uh, maliciousness, was probably wrong when he said that, uh, please be kind and, or if you want to make a comment, uh, do so. But if not, please Definitely. turn the microphone off. Uh, I hear it. the microphone. Thank you. So uh, I was saying that Oscar Wilde, with his uh, well-known maliciousness, said that uh, you know creativity doesn't need necessarily uh, you know uh, peace uh, and even prosperity. That uh, and he gave us an example: uh, Italy during the Renaissance, when there were terrible wars and poisonings and uh, crimes and so on, and yet. There was Michelangelo and uh, Brunelleschi and Raphael and Leonardo and so on. While he said Switzerland, which had peace, a lot of peace, and there were no conflicts and so on, they only produced the cuckoo clock. Well, obviously the the Swiss uh, can did and can do much more, and we see now just an, an example with Mario Botta. And in the present, there are very important Swiss architects. Uh, Peter Zumthor, uh, his birthday will be this month, and we'll talk about him, but there are others. Uh, and uh, so a country which is not big, but uh, uh, capable of, 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 uh, of doing much more than the cuckoo clock. Anyway, the single family house in Ligorneto, 1975 to 1976, uh, so in Switzerland, these are the plans. He works with symmetry, but he also dis uh, creates displacements within that symmetry and uh, erodes the symmetry with uh, sometimes uh, very engaging uh, uh, subtractions. Or you, you'll see, you'll understand what I'm saying. Because this is, you know, symmetrical, you see here, but then the, the, there is a cut here. This this part of the plan becomes different from the one on the right, and um, um, so there is symmetry, but there is also asymmetry. And um, it, it, he, I think, he did very very well at that time with you know creating an architecture which was uh, original, uh, powerful. Uh, interesting. Unfortunately, uh, after the 80s, um, uh, you'll see. In fact, you wouldn't. You will. You will not see really because I, I, I chose only the buildings that I thought uh, uh, are, are 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 his best. I like the interiors very much. You know, it's 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 it's. Um, it's, it's sincere. It's it, it, you know there are no there is no plaster. No, you see how the building was built. He uses a lot of masonry, something that uh, most architects uh, these days don't, or some architects don't. Uh, and, and and he was truly very knowledgeable about how to create uh, masonry walls that are aesthetically uh, uh, interesting. Now, the, these sketches that he did, I wish he, he kept this manner, pointillist manner to, to sketch. He, I, I searched for drawings by him, and with the, the, these exceptions, these two, I, he gave up on this manner. But uh, this manner has a certain uh, graphic poetry, which I personally like. Anyway, we saw this picture. Uh, the public gymnasium in Balerna, 1976-1978. Again, we have the robustness of, of geometry and then uh, the, the, the breaks, 
and and the, the, the open space is uh, equal, equally valid and it has a meaning, although maybe it's not an explicit function uh, um, honored here or served, but um, such, usually such spaces become uh, catalysts for interesting activities that happen ad hoc. Um, so it's not bad, I think. Uh, it has a vigor, a vitality. Now a library uh, in Lugano, 1976 to 1979, um, again, a, a symmetrical plan. And, uh, you know, some historicist uh, detail, if I can call it so. But otherwise, the building has, uh, because of the diagonal, is, is thoroughly modern and, uh, uh, yeah, it is dynamic. A library. A single family house in Pregasona, Switzerland, 1979 to 1980. This is a famous house, used to be published all the time in those years. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this. Uh, this, you know, if he did it once, it would have been fine. But he kept repeating this, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult when you, um, I don't know exactly what happened to him. Today, when I was working on the presentation, I even thought of writing something with the title, What Happened to You, Mario Bota? Um, this is interesting. It's a cube. It is, uh, it is uh, eroded. Uh, uh, but uh, these erosions are also, I, I could call them perhaps just like in the case of, uh, of Carlos Scarpa, although the work of Scarpa is very different from Mario Botta. Uh, when I wrote once about Carlos Scarpa, I used this um, oxymoronic uh, expression, positive erosions. He eroded the cube. You know, he took the cube, but then he began to excavate and subtract from it. And that's what I mean by erosions. You, you see the plans of the building. They are not, uh, it's not a building that is difficult to decipher. But somehow the expression is not, uh, you know, a simplistic one or a, even a, an easy one. A single family house in Massagno, Switzerland, 1979 to 1981. This one um, different from the other one and yet somehow similar. These are typical uh, Mario Botta buildings. Interesting, this, this circle, it's monumental. And, and yet, because of the way he used the masonry and, uh, you know, they, they, this you don't quite expect to be a single family house when you look at this picture, because it has a, the rhetorics are uh, somehow uh, beyond the, the limits of what we call uh, you know, private residence. The plan is interesting, you know, he has uh, opaque walls, you know, and then he cuts into uh, the house. So it has just a few uh, windows. And it's interesting, this uh, intermediate space between the rooms. You know, here you have rooms which communicate with the outside through this intermediate space. This is a, a stair that is uh, very similar to, at least in plan, to the stair that um, Louis Kahn built at the, the Yale uh, Art Gallery, um, an earlier work by Louis Kahn. Although there are similarities between um, uh, Mario Botta and Kahn, uh, Mario Botta has his distinctive uh, aesthetics, and distinct, distinctive architecture. Yeah, this, this intermediate space, as I called it, is interesting. And it, 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 
is, is this space in between the outside and the inside, which is very valuable, I think. So this is Mario Bota, now from 1980s, a single family house in Viganello. Uh, this one, well, already we are, we are approaching the dangerous field of what is called postmodernism. Uh, but still, the building you see is not afraid of uh, vast uh, areas of um, opaque walls. You don't see the typical windows, you know, that uh, seem to be unavoidable in, in the case of a house. 1980, 1982, the single family house in Stabio, Switzerland. So if Frank Lloyd Wright was right that uh, the most difficult thing uh, in architecture is the window, uh, Mario Botta tried to address this problem in, uh, in, in, in his own way. We don't have, very rarely we see windows as we know them. You know, like, you know, this is more than a window. It's, it's, it's a wall that is glassed. And, and then you have the masonry walls, fortress-like. And they, it, it's a certain conception about the house that uh, allows him to do this. So you don't have the typical room with a with typical window. No, there is a uh, almost a confusion. But no, I shouldn't call it confusion. It's the publicness of the private building that seems to concern him here. Not always. Like here, yes, we have that. Even here, you know, they they, they are not the typical windows. It's an interesting house, almost temple-like. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Ah. Where is it? I hear a voice, but I don't know where this comes from. Ah, it's not me, but anyway, uh, sorry about this. This uh, agitates me because I, I am afraid that something will happen with our connection. And uh, anyway, we continue. <clears throat> so you see the interior of the house has, you don't know, this could have been some other function, not a single family house. It's not too big, actually, but he, he is able to create a spatial configuration, which is, uh, uh, which goes beyond what is uh, predictable. And uh, I think this is interesting. I call it the publicness of the private space. And you see the, this, uh, this um, uh, it is the stair here towards the outside. You see, it becomes almost like a column here with an interesting capital. And uh, there are archetypal elements here at work that uh, make the building. Uh, he's also an architect who uses the wall, the blank wall, the, the opaque wall. Uh, as opposed to many other architects with much more conviction. He believes in the masonry wall. A single family house in Aurelio, uh, Switzerland, 1981, 1982. A play also with a, with a circle and the cube.
<clears throat> now a church, as I told you, he, he built several churches and some of them very interesting. 1986-1996. This one is, I think, not bad. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a church which uh, shows uh, creativity and um, again, his belief in the masonry wall. Uh, a masonry wall which which becomes also ornamental there is drama yes there is culturalness there is um, you know here is christ but in my opinion, a house which is um, dramatic and uh, I mean, a building which is dramatic and, uh, you know, engaging uh, in a sculptural way uh, is, is, uh, is only serving the purpose of the exceptionalism of what the church is supposed to be. Look at the plan. section the other section If a chapel or a church or a basilica or a cathedral, if they are the houses of God, then I think it's only normal to make the houses of God special. I think it's normal. If God was and is speci special, then his house, his home should also be special. And I don't know why in certain parts of the world, <laughs> It is not thought, thought so, and it's very, very sad. A good building, I think, by uh, Mario Bota. Some nervous, uh, nervous sketches. I wanted to incorporate drawings by him, but not, not all his drawings seem to be, uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, so this is a church, but you'll see at least three, four more. And truly this differentiates him from uh, most architects because he built a lot of churches and he had and has a lot of interest in what is called, as I said, uh, sacred, sacred architecture. A single family house in Lausanne, 1987, 1989. This is also interesting. He likes the cube. He likes the cylinder. Here we have the cylinder excavated or, or incavated, if there is such a thing. Um, you see here those erosions as I call them or positive erosions they are they are sabotaging the um, the cylinder but I think it's a, an important gesture in his architecture in a way the the presence of absence what was removed uh, continue somehow to haunt the house and uh, in that sense is the presence of absence.
probably architecture students, <laughs> I, I imagine. Anyway. Another single family house, not so small, but interesting too. And again, you would say, where are the windows? Well, yeah, he certainly was able to bring light in, but not through conventional windows. And uh, this is, it makes his, if you look at this building, you know, it's kind of mysterious, you know, you, he, but I'm sure it, it functions very well. And it is this interstitial space, I think, which is so important. Interesting buildings. This is not a small building at all. That is the protective mask, the, the frontal wall, which the fortress wall, which, which uh, protects the house, which is be behind it. And these rooms are ventilated and lit through this, this space, which is intermediate between the outside and the inside. Another church, 1987, 1994. This is, uh, I think he, he, he did some, some excellent buildings uh, where, where, where the geometry is very strict and, but because of those excavations or incavations, I don't know why I'm creating this impossible word, incavation, uh, such a word probably doesn't exist. Um, and it's about subtraction, as I said, the, the, the positive erosions. He erodes the building, he erodes, he erodes the cube in various ways. Here there is a sabotaging of the cube. You see the, the stair, the, 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 the cross here, and then uh, it, it's interesting. It's amazing how many such small churches were built in Italy. I'm sure other architects build them too, not just Mario Botta. But he was able to, to have a steady uh, flow of, um, of, of clients from uh, uh, in this field in Italy. Very open-minded, this churchman, as opposed to those in my country here. excellent masonry you know, uh, it's not just a blank wall it has it has a texture and uh, it, yeah a residential settlement from 1988 1992 unfortunately i only have two or three pictures here and not the best resolution but you still see uh, creativity and even monumentality in the field of and again, I think what differentiates his architecture from other people's architecture is the unusualness of, of the windows. You know, where are the typical, you know, uh, windows of block of flats? In fact, if you look at it, you are not even sure this is an apartment building, but it is. I mean, these windows here, yes, they are, but uh, all in all, the building um, puzzles one with its openings. And uh, he also has, uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, arrangements on the, on the ground floor, which, uh, you know, it's a luxury in a way to have in a, in a block of flats, uh, something like this. Again, the, somehow the influence of Louis Kahn is, um, is, uh, is to be perceived. 1990s, a chapel, Santa Maria degli Angeli on Mount Tamaro in Switzerland, 1990-1996. This is a very fine uh, construction in an exceptional setting. 
look at this. You, you don't know when was this built? Is it a relic? Is it a ruin? Is it, um, was it built in the Middle Ages? No, it was built by Mario Botta on top of a hill. And uh, it's a chapel. It has a religious program. It is destined to spirit, to vita contemplativa, but it is heroic. It's not very big, but it has a, an obvious monumentality. Again, the wall, the masonry wall, extremely important for Mario Botta. And the interior is also, uh, you know, modern and uh, intriguing in, in engaging. Uh, what is this here? I don't know. Here I see two hands, it seems. Uh, anyway, um, it is creativity. That's what it is, you know. And the church is supposed to be maybe the most creative because it's the house of God. But where I speak from, the church is not at all creative. Sad, <clears throat> very, very sad. And this is more than just the building, is the, is the whole ambiance, the, the whole environment is, is a structure which uh, is as uh, eloquent for what it isn't than for what it is. Look at the plan. You know, almost contemporary with this, in fact, contemporary with this was deconstruction. Truly contemporary with this was deconstruction. Uh, Mario Botta believed in the wall, believed in the solid wall, believed in masonry and uh, in organic materials, bricks, stones. Two thousands. The church in Santa Maria Nuova, uh, primal, archetypal. Uh, I like it. I like it from this side more than from the other. You actually enter through the lower uh, height uh, part and then you know, the culmination of the church is here in this. Uh, he obviously loves the, the, the sacred program. He loves to build churches. And uh, who shouldn't? I mean, who couldn't? Who wouldn't? <laughs> you know, uh, but what is strange in certain schools of architecture, this program is not even addressed. For six long years, no temple, no church, no chapel, no commemorative park, nothing having to do with the spiritual life, the side of life, nothing. And it's true, discouraged by uh, the so-called beneficiary, a very uh, uncollaborative uh, client, so to speak. Anyway, an interesting building Interesting both uh, outside and inside. He truly had a chance to, 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 to work for uh, programs that allow him to, to be very free and uh, very creative. Uh, what is this kind of a fragmented cross or is a mystery, but uh, mystery should be allowed in the house of God, it should be promoted even.
San Carlino, now here you'll see something different and very interesting. I like this. This, uh, this was done in honor of uh, Borromini because Borromini was actually born in, uh, in, uh, in that part of Switzerland. And uh, I don't know what anniversary it was. So um, Mario Botta was commissioned to create something to honor the great uh, Borromini. So he took the church, the most famous church by Borromini, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, and he rebuilt it, half of it, cut, sectioned on the edge of the, of the lake. I think it was a brilliant idea, you know, the, the building was designed by Borromini, but Mario Botta honored him and it was supposed to be in honor of him, of Borromini, by taking San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane and, and section it in half and uh, build this during about three, four years, this was built. And I truly think it's a very nice homage to the great Borromini. I don't know if you know, but Borromini who built this masterpiece of the Baroque architecture, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, he refused to get paid for his work for this church. He thought that working for God should not be measured in money. I mean, how many architects would think like this today? Not many, even those who are not really struggling. It was a different kind of man, you know, uh, an idealist, a uh, man who maybe you would call such a person mad or crazy, but we are talking about one of the geniuses of architecture. Um, so, I'm sure Tadawan, uh, not Tadawando, uh, Mario Botta loves uh, Boromini. And uh, this was his, uh, his homage uh, to Boromini. Truly, architecture is beautiful when it is an adventure. If it is not an adventure, it could be the most boring thing in the world. But if it is an adventure, if it is creative, if even if it is so-called crazy, all for the better. As Einstein said, and I know I quote a lot from him because I love his thoughts on education. He said, you know, uh, uh, an idea which, is, which does not appear um, uh, crazy at first is, is a lost idea. And, and, and I, 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 I agree. Creativity has to be wild, you know, has to be other. So this is what he did. You see here the plan of, uh, of, um, of Boromini's church. So he cut it in half and he built this. Nice work. And this was truly just an homage. He didn't try to create himself an original building. Although I think it is original, his homage, very much so. To expose the interior of a church in this way, it does take courage and imagination. Yeah, it is a great homage to the great Boromini. I tried to pay homage to Boromini too in 2000, uh, I think 17, when the railway, I forgot, either 300 years since his birth. And I, I organized an exhibition in Vienna, in Vienna, in Austria, with the title Angst Baroque. And on, on that very day when, when he was born, um, I, I, uh, I gave a lecture on, about him, about Boromini. I, I love Boromini too. Too bad he didn't love himself. Maybe you know he committed suicide at, I think, 66 or 68. Some say because of his uh, enmity with, uh, with, with Bernini. I don't know. We don't know. But uh, he was great, Boromini. And so was Bernini, of course. 2000 stands. I mean, the work's done after 2010. We are approaching the end of this uh, introduction in the work of um, Mario Botta. Another chapel, 
in Austria, which looks a little bit irreverential at first. Look at this, <laughs> you know. But but this is what I meant when I talked about the otherness of the house of God. If the house of God is not other, then what? It is supposed to be, even in this form. Now, it doesn't look so spectacular from all sides. From this one does. But uh, from other sides, it doesn't look so convincing. But I show, it, I show it on this side. And you just see the cross here, you know, enigmatical. It's more like a plus, in a way. That's it. This is the chapel in Austria. And I love these people that they are creative, you know, and they're playful and uh, unconventional. And they are supposed to be so. And let's hope the students in architecture and the architects uh, get provoked and they will, uh, because again, <laughs> coming to the great source of wisdom that I refer to all the time, creativity is contagious, pass it on. So Boromini pass it on, passed it on to uh, Mario Botta, Mario Botta is passing it on to us. And now it is time for us to pass it, it on uh, to other people. We just have to situate ourselves in connection with them. And then it will be a, a continuum. Here is the church. A church would make, uh, would provoke palpitations, at least in uh, certain segments of a certain uh, religion in a certain country, which refuses to understand that the house of God is supposed to be different, special, other. Thank you and happy birthday, uh, Mario Botta.